Good afternoon, everyone um, who's in this room and also watching us online. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and the, the report is um, incredibly interesting um, and wonderful to read. So I'll reiterate the request, or um, just to say that it was it's very quite informative because I think a lot of us who work in education have an intuitive sense that these stakeholders have different perspectives. Um, but it's, this is one of the first studies that I've seen that actually documents um, the degree to which there are differing perspectives around you know, what should be considered um, in good, good traits for success and all those kinds of things. So I'll start with that. Um, and then one of my other tasks as uh, a moderator is to um, remind the audience and those of, uh, those of you who are watching the webcast to follow the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag breadth of skills. So I'll just get that out of the way first before introducing um, our wonderful panel um, that we're going to be hearing from. And so I'm just going to do a very simple introduction of their names and titles. And then what I've asked them to do is actually, um, given the fact that some of the challenges of this, um, that this report reveals also in this conversation around what should we be teaching students, is the notion that the world is fast moving and quickly moving. And so as we're teaching students for this world now, 30 years later when they're adults um, or 20 years later, will those skills still be relevant? So what, what I've asked the panelists to do is to say really quickly in 30 seconds, what's a skill that they themselves have learned um, in schools that they feel they're still using now um, in, these, in these incredibly important sounding jobs? Um, so to my immediate left um, is Mr. Darius Ogotu, um, from whom you've heard this morning, and he is a Director of Policy Partnerships in East African Community Affairs in the Ministry of Education in Kenya. Um, and then next, um, we have Daniel Hernandez, who is the academic coordinator under Ministry of Higher um, Middle Education in Mexico. And then we have Therese Bustos, who is the Dean of the College of Education at the University of the Philippines. Um, and then uh, finally, we have Mathanzima Muwali, who is the Director General of the Department of Basic Education in South Africa. So um, actually, Daniel, if you wouldn't mind starting with your story about what you, something that you learned that you feel like you're still doing, practicing in your job today. Thank you, Connie. At age seven, I learned from my teacher, the best teacher I ever had, that a determination and effort was critical for my success in life. Great. There is. Uh, well, my most memorable days in school, I think, were in my English classroom. And this is because my teacher was more or less like uh, my grandmother. And she allowed us to make noise in class. She allowed us to sing, dance, and do stuff that other teachers mm -hmm. don't allow us to do. Essentially, she made us learn through play. And up to this time, I remember her fondly. And maybe that's one of the reasons why I became a teacher and an educator. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you so you. much. Yes. <laughs> Oh, um, mine is not exactly a skill, but I think I learned flexibility mm -hmm. and to be resourceful in school. It's not so much of what the teachers taught me, but what the environment taught me. So I guess in the talk about um, all of these skills being part of the curriculum, the environment really has to be taken into consideration. And again, as we kind of talk about how, how broad the breadth of skills have become, you know, one of the underlying questions is, you know, what exactly falls under the responsibility of the schools versus lots of other places where young people spend their time. And I think one of the earlier reports that Brookings actually produced talked about these multiple layers of environments and the hours that young people spend. And so which skills um, for which environment and whose responsibility, I think, is an underlying question for all this. Well, thank you very much, uh, Connie. Uh, what, what I remember is that uh, um, from my very early um, age, I liked teaching even before I got to train and qualify as a teacher, including um, you know, helping other students who were in higher grades than the one that I was in. Um, but I never wanted to become a teacher but I, I got to love teaching ever since then. Um, I trained as an administrator. I still behave uh, like a teacher. <laughs> That's wonderful. So again, these people with incredible titles and having tremendous responsibilities were once young kids who, you know, who were, were influenced quite well by their teachers. Um, so we'll start off with that. And so just diving into the report next, 
Um, it seems that the skills that are being emphasized in each country, as um, Esther and Helen explained, is dependent on context um, and the challenges and the needs of the moment, um, and including what you're thinking of, of, of as, far, as far as priorities. So could each of you, I wonder, talk very briefly about which skills are being emphasized in your country and how that speaks to your context and priorities? We'll just go down the row. Uh, okay, in the context of Kenya, the main skills that we're emphasizing currently is um, literacy, numeracy, and some element of digital awareness. And uh, these are key for us because uh, over some time now, children go through the system and go through the levels, but they do not learn uh, basic competencies. They do not acquire basic competencies. So it's not uncommon to find somebody who's gone through the system, but they are not able to read or write as expected. So for us, the basics in terms of literacy and numeracy are critical for the children to acquire this so that they can be able at least to go through uh, the rest of the levels or the curriculum with a, a certain level or standard of uh, understanding. And then the issues of digital literacy. Uh, we're trying to accustom our children to the realities uh, of the use of technology and most of them find this quite interesting. So issues of uh, using tablets, using mobile technology, and integrating this in learning is proving to be quite popular in a number of our schools. So we are in a small scale trying out this as we train teachers on how to integrate ICT in teaching and learning. Yeah. Thank you, Connie. Uh, Mexico is in, engaged in the launch of a new educational model. Uh, and this is something that the country needed for decades, basically. What we have been doing is reviewing the curriculum, actually to try to uh, align it between the different uh, educational levels, primary, secondary, uh, higher, middle education. Second, we have reviewed the curriculum in order to uh, improve relevance. And that basically means to take out a lot of topics that history had put them uh, there over the years. Uh, by doing that, we expect to see uh, the opportunity for teachers to uh, develop deeper learning in their, in their students and to develop some interdisciplinary uh, practices so that uh, students can engage in critical thinking in mathematics and then bring that to uh, uh, sciences, for example. We have 11 areas uh, of, uh, in the new uh, curriculum. Uh, we have three of them are related to content, uh, disciplinary content, literacy and communication, mathematical thinking, and the exploration and understanding of the natural and social world. And I want to em emphasize that we are putting there exploration and understanding because that's kind of how we are introducing uh, skills like analytical thinking into the curriculum. Then we have the critical thinking, problem solving, social emotional skills, which is something that uh, our society is very much uh, engaged in because uh, we are looking for a society that faces critical problems of violence, basically. So uh, we are very interested in, in dealing with social emotional skill and collaborative and teamwork related for, job, for the job market. And then, uh, obviously, as a society as diverse as Mexico needs to think in diversity, tolerance, and citizenship, uh, arts appreciation, health and personal care. Mm -hmm. You saw the numbers, how many youth we had in Mexico, so we need to prepare them for a changing world in, the, in which uh, health is an issue. Uh, environmental care, uh, and digital skills. And in digital skills, it's not only the use of, of ITCs, the, of, of ICTs, but also the, the management of data and the analysis of the data that you get through uh, all these new technologies. Thank you. Oh. So the Philippine situation is yes. pretty much the same as Kenya and also Mexico. Uh, we're the last country in Asia to add uh, two years to our education system. So now we have a 12-year basic education system. Now, the intention is that hopefully students, after going through senior high school, they'd be able to 
find employment so they would have skills or they'd be able to open their own businesses so they have entrepreneurial skills or they can go to college. Now, having said that, um, there's also renewed emphasis on literacy and numeracy in the early grades because we believe that all the other 21st century skills are really uh, based on literacy and numeracy, like development on like being able, being able to read so that you can read the situation, think critically about the situation. So those things are very important to us. And so we're looking at the situation from both ends at, at the very young age where children need to be literate and numerate, and also at the two last levels where we want them to have information, um, media and technology skills, learning, critical thinking skills, and we also want them to be able to communicate and collaborate. So that's how it is for the Philippines. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you. I, I wouldn't like to repeat what the three colleagues <laughs> have covered. Um, we also emphasize on foundational uh, skills of literacy and numeracy uh, because we believe those skills are not only important, but they are indispensable mm -hmm. because uh, all learners will have to rely on them to acquire knowledge and skills as they progress in, in their schooling and even post-schooling. But maybe to add what has not been um, uh, shared, particularly for South Africa, well, um, over and above the fact that we've got a high unemployment rate and uh, data indicates that it uh, hits the ages, particularly between um, 15 and 24. Um, our curriculum focus over many years has been in the main um, uh, academic, in other words, providing for the academic stream to the detriment of your vocational stream. And I'm sure I'll have the opportunity to explain more as to why we're going quite radical in what we call the three-stream model in South Africa. It's not only important in changing the gear, but also to create a safety net for, for young people in, in, in our country. But I also need to mention that um, of the Millennium Development Goals, sometimes referred to as principles to determine the performance of any education system, uh, five of those, which is access, redress, equity, efficiency, and quality. South Africa is doing well in three. Uh, in terms of access, we almost have universal coverage. We've got 99% of young people who are supposed to be at school, who are attending school. And in terms of the second one, redress, um, for instance, we've got what we call a pro, um, proper policies implemented by government where parents are not expected to pay school fees. Um, so because of that, 99%, um, uh, as I said, only 60,000 um, uh, learners or uh, young people in our country are not attending school, but the rest are in school. Um, also in terms of equity, you've got more girls uh, attending school and more girls who are, in fact, girls do better than, than boys, both from primary school up to secondary school. I must also indicate that we have increased the level of output in our secondary school from 48,000 to over 400,000. Universities are unable to cope in South Africa, and that's why you experienced uh, you know, what would have been seen in the media circle as fees must fall. And part of the reason is because universities are the only post-schooling option, the only post-viable option uh, in South Africa. We are working as part of Africa and the region to make sure that uh, Tibet colleges come on board to assist, to absorb more and more young people. And uh, we also, in terms of our curriculum, we've gone through five curriculum um, changes in South Africa over 23 years, which has been quite bumpy. And uh, 
destabilizing, you know, um, um, the education in South Africa. Uh, but fortunately, with the last um, um, five to eight years, there has been some stability, um, wherein the curriculum emphasizes on high knowledge and high skills. It's for that reason that we're focusing on five critical skills, which are problem solving, um, critical thinking, creativity, innovation, uh, teamwork, and uh, social justice and human rights. We strongly believe that uh, these skills are inextricably intertwined with um, uh, subject domains. We don't see the two as distinct. Uh, in fact, we see them as complementary because we believe that uh, you can only demonstrate knowledge by also using the skills. So briefly, that's, that's where we are as a country. Thank you so much. You. And that's a perfect segue um, to the next set of questions, which, as Darius kind of provocatively said this morning, research, we're drowning in research. It's the implementation that is sometimes the issue. So I wonder if, if our panelists could talk about, as you um, continue to focus on subject areas while realizing that there needs to be um, a shift in focus around some of these um, broader sets of skills, what kinds of things have you seen happen in your country as you try to implement these changes, including opportunities and challenges? Um, and I wonder, if, Teresa, if you could speak as a dean of College of Education around you know, what your thinking is around teacher education, school leadership education, as you're looking, to, again, to kind of marry those two um, areas to the fact that you know, most people seem to be recognizing there needs to be a broader range of skills that need to be taught. That's right. Well. I guess the University of the Philippines is quite unique because it's the national university, and so we get the best students. However, I would have to say that for the field of education, it does not really attract the best of students. And so the situation in my college is not the situation outside. And so we end up having teachers who would really need help implementing all of these reforms that we would like to see in the field. and. I guess in terms of teacher preparation, that has been a challenge. Uh, yesterday I was saying that in many cases, we're asking teachers to teach skills that they did not learn themselves, skills that they don't have themselves. And so how on earth will they be able to teach those skills? And so what happens is we come out with curriculum, um, teaching guides that, that are so prescriptive that I think kill their own creativity kill their own I mean, levels of critical thinking. And so there's this tension now. So what do you do? Um, how do you produce at least teachers whom you can trust to teach um, things that would achieve the nation's goals? And so that is where the challenge is, I think, for teacher education in my country. Um, teacher education has to become more attractive. It has to attract really the best and the brightest. But seriously, with the conditions that are present, the working conditions, they don't attract the best. The best go elsewhere. And yet we do have, as a country, very lofty goals that we want our teachers to implement. And so I think for my country, that is a challenge. So how do we get past that? Um, well, I guess I don't know how it is with the other countries. Probably the situation is the same. The great questions, Darius, as a former teacher yourself, I wonder if you thought about this question. Yes, the challenges are more or less similar in the sense that um, we do not get the best um, to join teaching profession. But I normally be, this is my own personal opinion that the ones we have are the best for the time being, and we need to make the best use out of them. Yeah. And, and so, because Technically, we have over 250,000 teachers. You're not going to get 250 new teachers again. You have to work with these 250,000 mm -hmm. teachers that are in place. And they've produced uh, uh, highly skilled um, learners in one way or the other. So they have something in them. They only need our support, maybe, so that they can do better than they're doing. And 
we are trying to do this through the systems, um, tweaking around with the system and uh, seeing how we can work on the issues of um, uh, the reforms that we're talking about. And, and as we focus on issues of the science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, we're also remembering that, as she said, they may not have been trained on it, but they can be supported so that they can support the children. And uh, we are now also considering introducing vocational education and technical training to junior secondary so that children are able to be accustomed to other possibilities so that they don't think that to be successful, you only need to go to university. There are other mid-level training that can be taken on board. And we are helping the teachers to identify the learners' talents at the earliest possible time so that they can be nurtured and they can be trained on those talents and they can be able to develop further on it. Kenya is a country of world champions and Olympic champions, I keep on saying. But these champions become champions because they are identified early in their schooling life. And from the time they are maybe eight years old, nine years old, they are already practicing the marathon or cross country or 800 meters. By the time they reach 15, 16, 18 years, they are world champions because they've been doing this all their lives. Why? Because a teacher somewhere identified them and nurtured them. And this is what we are pushing. And, and we are also bringing in another aspect of service learning so that even if you're going through education, you're in the system, well, you still are part of the community. And you have to look at how you can contribute in whichever small ways to community. Then the whole aspect of values, that uh, going through an education system without any values, then you cannot be uh, a constructive citizen in the country or even in the world. And, and we are instilling these values from the earliest opportunity possible. And we hope that with age-appropriate content, this can be done across board. It's not only in one subject, but it's across the curriculum. That every teacher has a responsibility to instill certain values in the children. And when we do this collectively, then we are able to produce children whom we can be proud of and say, yes, this is the 21st century citizen that we're looking at. Thank you so much. Um, Danielle, one of the questions that I might have is that, you know, curriculum development and change um, is partly about, you know, what needs to be taught, but it also happens, as we learned earlier in the panels, about um, the political environment. Um, and as you have an, an election coming up in Mexico next year, and as you're implementing and making these changes in the context of a political environment, I wonder if you could speak about this question around implementation challenges and opportunities with that frame in mind as well. Oh, thank you, Connie. Uh, obviously, uh, when you launch a new educational model uh, about two years before the new presidential election, there are uh, concerns about how much can be done. Uh, <laughs> but uh, when you have been in the educational sector for some years, you know that two years is a lot of time. Uh, what can be done? For example, uh, we have been working on uh, socio-emotional skills. And uh, what we have been done is trying to develop activities for teachers so that they can introduce them in their curriculum development every, every day, basically. These are activities that take 10 minutes. Uh, in, in the way that we can uh, enhance these activities and establish these activities as regular activities for teachers, uh, we can be sure that changes will happen whatever happens. Uh, the second idea that we are trying to uh, disseminate is that skills uh, beget skills. Uh, as I showed yesterday to some of you, uh, we have data that show that uh, students that have higher levels of social-emotional skills are also uh, developing better academic scores. Uh, this is a, a causal link, basically. It, it, it's, it's not... It's, it's proven by <laughs> statistical models. Uh, but in, the, if in as much as we can develop this idea also, uh, we can be sure that change can be, can be established. The third thing is uh, teacher's training. Uh, we have launched a very uh, strong new uh, teacher's formation program uh, 
that tries something that uh, I don't know if Esther or Susan talked to, talk this morning about uh, that skills development needs a more interactive pedagogy. And that requires a, a new form of teacher's formation, a, a form that uh, introduces the idea of interactions as relevant, as respect for students is relevant. And in that way, we are uh, training, and we have done that with 25,000, and we hope to reach another 75,000 in the next couple of years, at, the, at, at least in, in, in higher middle education, in a new ways of interacting with, with students through uh, courses based on videos, on, on class observation, uh, with interactions on general interactions, math interactions, communications interactions, and gender interactions. So uh, we think that if you start change, the change, uh, two years can do a lot of things. In two years, you can do a lot of things. Uh, the problem is when you stop and think, well, what is going to happen in two years? Well, whatever happens, uh, you can uh, promote change and start change uh, uh, in this time. Great, thank you. Fansma, could you talk a little bit about the teacher's role and how that might be changing in South Africa? And again, this larger question around implementation and some of the challenges and opportunities that you see. Well, w one thing for sure, with, with all our challenges in the country, South Africa is a, a country of immense opportunities. Um, but I want to cast my eyes uh, beyond South Africa. One is that um, at least um, within the continent, there is convergence. Um, we have what we call the uh, Continental Education Strategy for Africa uh, 2020 towards um, 2025, which is linked to uh, the Education Agenda 2030 driven by UNESCO. Uh, in South Africa, we at least have uh, for the first time, what is called the National Development Plan, which affords us long-term planning. Um, even though, you know, you would have administrations coming and going, mm -hmm. at least there's a plan driving the vision of the country towards 2030. That gives us some semblance of hope. Um, and, and because of that, and, and the plan is quite clear on what needs to be done, uh, foundational skills of numeracy and literacy, it's quite explicit and, and very, very detailed on what needs to be done. And, and we've started following that plan. And, um, and given the fact that we've got continental obligations, um, we have no choice but to make sure that whatever we do also delivers on continental obligations. Uh, I mean, the sustainable goal four also, uh, it's quite clear on what we, need to, what we need to do. And because of all those, we came up with what we call the three-stream model. The, the three-stream model is about focusing and uh, uh, placing an emphasis on making sure that uh, we get more and more young people doing math, science, and technology subjects, or STEM subjects. Uh, and of course, there is another focus for arts and culture in terms of focus schools. But we are of the view that um, uh, part of you know, what is called skills of the 21st century is around math and science. And before 2008, a large number of young people uh, particularly at secondary school, when we're not exposed to doing mathematics. But since 2008, all young people are expected to do some kind of mathematics. There are three types of mathematics in South Africa. You've got core mathematics, you've got technical mathematics, and mathematical literacy. Mathematical literacy is mathematical for, mathematical, um, mathematics for social use. In other words, every citizen is, I mean, is expected to have skills and knowledge of uh, that kind of mathematics for, for, you know, for successful living. Um, and we also have the opportunity in terms of other developments I've referred to, 
you know, the notion of uh, fees must fall in South Africa. Linked to that, uh, the young people have been quite vocal about decolonizing the education system. And we have accepted that for a long time, um, we've been implementing um, an education system that has explicit um, uh, features of a colonial uh, education system, um, which was essentially preparing young people to look for jobs. And we've now changed the focus to say, the third stream that we're bringing in is now going to focus on getting skills for young people to create jobs. We've developed a curriculum based on 26 subjects, um, which brings early, as early as grade six, uh, your artisan skills um, and other skills that they would require for entry level in, in the labor market. We are of the view that uh, the economy in terms of uh, creating employment might be a bit saturated. I'm hopefully aware that for, for the two to three days that I've been here, we've also been downgraded. Uh, so, which would add to our, you know, our woes. And, and therefore the notion of uh, making sure that young people are empowered to uh, create jobs and um, to have portable skills and um, but also uh, to make sure that those skills will afford them to succeed um, not only in South Africa beyond borders of South Africa the continent and the world great thank you so much I'm going to ask one more set of questions to the panelists and then we're going to open it up to the floor just so the audience um, is ready for your, with your questions but as kind of a last um, Question for the panelists, what kinds of reflections or thoughts or questions came up for you um, as you read the report, which actually is a wonderful way to kind of take you out of your own particular country's context and at least see you know, the challenges and opportunities in, in other countries. Um, and I wonder if you kind of talk very briefly about what keeps you up at night? What's an unsolvable problem as you're tackling this you know, large question around how do I help my education system prepare our young people for not only success in their own lives, but for, as we heard you know, down the line, um, success for the country as a whole. So what's a, what's, a, what's, a, what's a remaining question for you? And then what's um, an important uh, kind of a, a reflection that you saw from just reading the report? Uh, if I may start. Um, yeah, please. What I normally think about at night is how do I crystallize it for each of the stakeholders? to realize that we are in it together. It's not just government, it's mm -hmm. not the policy makers, but the teacher, the parent, the child, the private sector, the business owner, that we are in this together and we owe it to each other to work together because each of us has their own strengths. But when you keep it to yourself, your own strength, yes, you're strong, but only in your area, yet your strength can help build this community. And there is this saying we normally talk about, nothing for us without us. So it's an all-inclusive um, reform agenda. The teachers are on board, the parents are on board. We even have the children on board through what we call the children government. We've got the children on board telling us what they would want school to be like, what they would want learning to be like. But then how do we communicate that we've heard you loud and clear and what we are coming up with is good for you and for this country. And uh, Hubert talked about decolonizing education. I think more of what Professor Ngugi Wadiongo says about decolonizing the mind mm -hmm. so that people think that we are in need for the good of the community. It's not just because I'm on the government side, mm -hmm. but I'm also a parent and I would like to see my child learn. I'm a stakeholder, I'm a businessman, I'm in industry. And I want somebody who coming through the system who's well oiled and ready to work. I would want to support startup businesses, people who come out of institutions ready to begin business, ready to create employment for others, or even who do that while in school. And we have this great idea about entrepreneurship, how we can create entrepreneurs even while they are in school. They come up with business ideas, which then are nurtured and go through kind of an incubation system, and they can be implemented. And great 
I look ahead and see great things for Africa and more so great things for Kenya. I'm really optimistic. Maybe because I'm an optimist, I don't know. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Connie. Let me start with something that I, I, I want to say about my last answer. Uh, my optimism, uh, for long years, comes from, uh, I was one of the persons in charge of changing social policy in Mexico uh, two years before the change of the government. And that program has remained over four different governments with change of parties in the country. So uh, I have the experience that that can happen. So uh, say, that said, uh, let me tell you that I like the report because it's very down to earth. Uh, and it, we started a reform uh, in higher middle education in Mexico in 2008 based on the competences model. And we thought that we knew everything. And once we read the report and we had the meetings with Emily and, and so on, uh, we discovered that there has been a lot of learning about the skills process in, over the last 10 years in the world. And uh, that the things are very similar to the problems that we have faced uh, over the last 10 years in, 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 in our system. Uh, skills progression. That is one of the things that uh, is more important and that we hear from the teachers every day. Mm -hmm. Not the evaluation of skills uh, in a yearly exam or three-year exam or whatever, but how teachers track that task that we are asking them to perform in the classroom uh, that is very far from what they have learned in, in teachers' colleges or in, their, uh, or in universities. Uh, so this is one of the things that I like the most about the paper. The second thing is that uh, different stakeholders have different ideas about, about skills. So, uh, and that uh, we as uh, middle managers, we need to understand that the information that we need to uh, transmit to all the stakeholders mm -hmm. has to uh, address the things that they are looking at and how they look at these uh, things that are skills that are not only our concern, but is also their concern in, in, uh, for the lives of their children. Uh, the third thing is that uh, skills can be taught, but teachers don't have all the tools for that, for that task. And one thing is that we need to think how to support them uh, and encourage them to do this, this work because it's not easy to close the door and be alone in front of 30, 40, 50 kids. Uh, so these are the three ideas that I like the most about, about the report. Uh, and th the last one is that you need to be serious about integrating skills into the curriculum. It cannot be something that uh, is done by, de by decree. Uh, it's something that needs a lot of work. Fortunately, we have been doing that over the last uh, 12 months in Mexico. I hope we did a good work. Uh, but obviously, this is a, a living process. And we need to be clear that we, we, will, be, we will need to be ready to do the uh, adjustments that need to be done once we start uh, uh, rolling out the whole process. I'm cognizant that Mathansba has always been the last person to speak, so I'm going to skip over Therese for now and have him speak and then go back, if that's okay. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I think what's quite interesting for me um, is the notion of uh, uh, providing young people with skills to become successful persons. And I hope that we're not defining success in terms of skills for, you know, affording them to look for jobs. I've already said in my own country, I believe that the labor market is a bit saturated. What we need to do is to create more capacity uh, for people to create more jobs. And that's what keeps me awake at night. The young people who are unemployed, and by the way, out of the 27%, uh, if my memory serves me well, 9% of those young people uh, have university degrees, but they can't get employment. So uh, uh, university education also is not a guarantee to getting employment. It depends what, what you study on, and it depends on the traction of the labor market as well. And that's why I'm of a very strong view that uh, we need to go quite aggressive and in equipping young people to be able to create uh, uh
more jobs. But I think the world has increasingly become an exciting place. In the midst of rumors of war and so on, I think uh, initiatives of this nature help to refresh our thinking, uh, sharpen our thinking as policy makers and uh, as also implementers. Um, but also reminding us that um, I was saying to one colleague that uh, increasingly uh, borders across countries are also becoming a bit obsolete because when I was growing up as a young person, my ambition was to go and work in cities with tall buildings and so on. I've achieved that dream. Mm -hmm. But the dream of my three children and the children of many of us is to find themselves somewhere. Uh, some would like to, when they wake up one day, they'll uh, wake up in the middle of a street in Moscow or a street in Germany or somewhere in Africa, in Accra, Ghana, or even Kenya, Nairobi. <laughs> So we have to equip them with those skills, portable skills, uh, that will afford them this mobility and still succeed in life and become, um, you know, human beings that are very significant in life to contribute to the development of, uh, you know, the, the, the globe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Teresa, the last word. Um, the last word. <laughs> So all this talk about skills for the changing world has, it's actually very future focused. Mm -hmm. And what keeps me awake at night is the present. And how do we get, I mean, take a look at our resources, take a look at what we have to get to that future. So having read the report, looking at the different country reports, well, one was a good thing. So at least my country is not alone in this um, fight to achieve one's goals, educational goals. However, it also gave me a, an appreciation of what was being done. As I've said, um, teacher training is an issue. However, the country has been trying its best to improve the inset in service training that we have been giving faculty, um, teachers. And so a lot of effort has been placed there. So we've thought of different paradigms on how to be able to cascade training more efficiently given the size of the bureaucracy. And so there are I can see positive things going on in the Department of Education. However, there are still things also that, need, that we need to pay attention to, things that we don't have really answers for. However, I guess because of this exercise of listening to each other and being able to express all of these concerns about that future, I guess I'm in a better position now to really think clearly about things that are going on in my country. Great, thank you so much. Um, we'd like to open it up to the audience for any um, questions that you might have based on what you've heard. Um, change is not just a cognitive process, but also social and an emotional. Um, and I think you've heard that theme throughout. Um, and of course, these folks who are on stage with us are not just talking, just concerned about the success of an individual child, but their whole country. So I think you raised some interesting thoughts. So I wonder if we can get like three or four questions at a time and then have um, and address them in, in, in groups of three or four. So there's a hand here. I see a hand here and a hand there. You know, the hands over there. <laughs> just go, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. That was a really engaging and interesting discussion. And I, I'm, my name is Nalini Chugani. I'm with Education Development Center. So I'm coming from the implementer side of it. So this is all very, very relevant. Um, and if I may, I have two questions. Um, the first is a little bit about young children. I want to ask about your experiences integrating soft skills into your Young, younger children cohorts, and what ages your countries are starting to do that with, and how, what experiences you're having around that. Um, my second question is around research and assessment, and really starting to think about assessment of soft skills. And it's really important that you have the teachers, the students, the community, everyone really on board, understanding the value of these skills. So in your important positions and where you all sit, in your countries, 
I want to know what you what you need from us. What do you need from implementers? What kind of research? What kind of information do you need? In in light of you know conversations this morning, there is so much research out there. But what what do you need? What do you need to really influence the policymakers? Make the teachers understand what you need. Make the students themselves understand the importance of this. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been an amazing whole day and yesterday of, I don't know, my head is way too full. Uh, my question has to do with teacher education. Everybody's talked about it. My name's Annie Kidder. I'm from Ontario, Canada. I run an organization that does research and advocacy around public education. Um, and I think no matter where we are in the world, we're all thinking kind of about the same things. So you all talked about new ways of thinking about teacher education, interactive pedagogy that we can't, you know, if we're going to teach teachers to teach in a different way. We have to teach them differently. So how would we do it? What would look different if you were going to redesign it completely? Um, what would that uh, new, new teacher education look like? Great. Hi, I'm Emily Gustafson Wright, one of the co-authors on the report. Thank you for a great panel and all of our country representatives. So my question is to Daniel. Um, so you mentioned how the progressive program has survived over multiple uh, administrations. So um, besides the fact that it's changed names from Progresa to Oportunidades to Prospera, which I actually don't think is minor, um, but what other lessons can you draw from that to apply to the new education model and the kinds of questions that we're talking about today? Is there one more hand that I saw right there? there? One more and then answer these and then take another few. Um, I'm Hajra Zahid from the MasterCard Foundation. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentations. Um, it seems that uh, each country that's been presented today and maybe many uh, others uh, have, uh, you know, they are working uh, within their own framework um, uh, within which they provide, uh, you know, a set of skills to their, to the young learners. And I wonder if uh, we should uh, take a pause as an international community, take a pause and see uh, whether there's a need to reduce uh, the fragmentation of, uh, of various frameworks um, and, uh, you know, come together and develop, you know, one framework of, of uh, competencies that need to be um, uh, uh, you know, nurtured at different ages, um, at different grade levels. Um, and uh, it may require consultation with psychologists, uh, with anthropologists, um, private sector, but it may streamline um, many of the things that we've been talking about, uh, which is about uh, you know, how do we assess skills, uh, how do we train teachers. So just a thought. Thank you. So just quickly summarize the questions that have come up. Um, there is a question around you know, what does this mean for very, very young people and what changes do we need to do from early childhood on? Um, a question about, you know, what do you need from implementers in order to change not just mechanisms but mindsets so that more people, more stakeholders value um, this, this broadening of skills and especially soft skills. Uh, a question around if you really were to change um, teacher education so that it would actually um, produce teachers who might be able to do this, what would teacher education look like? Um, and then question to Danielle specifically around, you know, based on your own experience of having run some of these programs, what are some of the lessons that might carry over transfer um, as you do this next uh, phase of, of educational reform? Um, and then this question around as much as it seems like context matters um, as you decide what to prioritize in your country, so from Kenya to South Africa, is there room for coming up with um, a uh, one singular framework that all of us can get behind so that we could share knowledge and streamline some of the changes that need to happen very, very quickly um, in, a, in a world that's also changing very quickly. So let me start uh, very fast. Uh, what we have learned from a uh, continuous teacher formation, uh, somebody said to, to uh, Susan, I guess, is 15 hours is better than 30. I agree with that. Shorter courses. Uh, that provide teachers with real world experience. Mm -hmm. uh, we're using a lot of videos coming out from classrooms. Uh, teachers don't believe that these are actual classroom videos. They say, why do you have actors? Well, no, this is, these are not actors. These are <laughs> actual, the best teachers that we have, and we want you to see what we are doing, what they are doing. Uh, and this is something that has been very successful among teachers. 
Lessons learned. Implement. Implement as fast as you can. Uh, reach uh, certain tasks that you promised to, to achieve in a short span of time. To document everything that you do. Maybe evaluations will take a little longer. We had the opportunity to do very, very fine evaluations that are the, the mark of the, of the social policy in, in the world. But it, it document everything you do so that uh, people can see what you have done. Uh, three, be transparent. Be, do things the right way. Basically, these three things are what has support a program that started very close to the close of the government to continue over the years. Well, the, the issue of, uh, thank you very much for, for the questions and comments. The uh, uh, issue of uh, reducing fragmentation uh, of frameworks. I think we, we, we almost, uh, I've, I've already indicated that uh, globally you've got uh, sustainable goal four. Uh, which is, in my view, very clear on what uh, member countries are expected to do. And um, at continental level, um, the framework has been even consolidated there. And then from the uh, continent, then at country level, you've got programs that are you know, responding to, to the framework. I've never seen such a level of synchronization in my whole life and career in educa for education at least. And, and from that point of view, that's why I'm saying we are in a better position, we are in a better space as the global village to do even better. I mean, you would have heard from yesterday, this morning up to now, if you listen to individual countries talking about core skills, they are essentially very generic and common uh, to many of us. Maybe what we might need to do is to pay some attention um, uh, to the curriculum. And I think Prof said it this morning. I think South Africa has the same challenge. Our curriculum is too wide, and we pay very little attention to depth, and we are attending to that. That's the recommendation that I would make. But in terms of frameworks, I think we, we, we almost, there's uh, more than enough convergence. Um, Teacher education, it's a million dollar question. It's a, it's a very difficult one. Well, what, what we've started doing in South Africa, there are two entry points. As the colleague from uh, Kenya indicated that the teachers that we have, at least for now, we have to, to do the best that we can because that's all that we have until we get those that are better than that, the ones that we have. Our teacher development programs have also not been in keeping with the skills that we are talking about. I'm talking about ongoing teacher development programs, programs that are intending to refresh teachers who are in the field already. So we need to sharpen our ongoing teacher development programs. Um, my old nomenclature, they used to be called in-service training mm -hmm. of teachers to make sure that those who are in charge of that get this message as well. Um, and then the, the, the second part of it is uh, initial teacher education. We've started some discussion because in South Africa we've moved from training teachers through uh, teacher training colleges. We are now training through universities. The research has indicated that new entrants into the profession are very strong on subject content knowledge, but very weak on pedagogy. And we think we know why, because universities are quite strong on knowledge creation and so on. But historically, at least in South Africa, they've not really been strong on, on teaching methodology. So that's how we are tackling that challenge from, from those uh, two points. Well, younger children's education, maybe as, as the last point, for early childhood development, uh, working with UNICEF and other partners, we've started to implement a, um, a national curriculum framework um, for early childhood uh, development. From, we're calling it from 
uh, zero to four year old in South Africa. We believe that uh, children learn even when they are still um, carried um, before they are delivered. Uh, we call it pre-birth. And we've developed the framework stimulation programs for mothers um, who are pregnant and beyond that, we now have a framework for those who go through our early childhood development centers. And we believe that um, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a strategy that is going to really turn around the situation and make sure that when these young people start schooling, they'll be school ready, they'll have the basic skills um, so that they start um, learning more uh, of the skills that uh, they'll be introduced uh, to from grade one. And then there's also some studies that show that you know, these are not two separate things, soft skills versus hard skills, that the more self-regulation and ability to do that, yeah. that you have that may perhaps even impacts your academic, so quote unquote, um, skills as well. So it's not, may not be two different buckets. Um, yeah. various. Just to add on to what Robert has said mm -hmm. is that uh, it is until I attended a Dohad meeting, uh, Developmental Origins of Health and Disease, that I got to come to terms with the tons of research evidence on the first 1,000 days of a child and how that impacts on the child's development in his or her own life. So the first 1,000 days when this individual gets into this world, what happens to that child almost impacts the whole life of this child. And we're now looking at it not as a Ministry of Education issue for early childhood, but we are partnering with Ministry of Health and saying when the parents bring their children to the clinic, can they be trained on early stimulation? Can they be given some ideas on what they can do with a child so that even before the child gets into the system, they are already encountering some, some subtle things that will enable them open up to learning. Because those first 1,000 days, they are not in the education system. They are out there with their mothers and the caregivers. So what is it that the caregivers and mothers can do so that when the child gets in the system, they are already ready to learn. They are, they've already you know, embraced aspects that will encourage them to go through the system. And we are making it very clear to the teachers at the early childhood level that it's not about teaching this child already to speak a new language or to count at that early age. It's about transiting from home to a school environment, from home to where they are meeting some other children and learning how to work together. And I know we normally talk about the fact that I can speak English doesn't mean that I'm intelligent. It's just a language that I've learned. And the intelligence in how I do other aspects, not just the language. So this, in, in Kenya we have parents who are possessed with their children knowing how to speak English, <laughs> you know, or so that when your child knows how to speak English, then you're happy. But at that time, it doesn't mean the child is intelligent. They've just learned how to speak a language. There are more milestones they need to achieve. And yes, we are integrating those soft skills and realizing that it's not only Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health have a role to play the parents, the caregivers, and all those that interact with this child before they get into the system. And by the time they are in the system, we are struggling to make sure there is readiness for learning by the time the child gets into grade one. O on the issue of what we need, I wish we would package all this evidence into what works in certain situations. So that if I am in Cape Town, South Africa, or Soweto, there is an adapted tool that will work in Cape Town, South Africa. If I'm in Nairobi, Kenya, there is something that I can adapt to my situation. And yes, we're working on regional and continental frameworks so that we are talking from the point of knowledge where we understand each other. I can talk to Hubert and say, oh, on this aspect, this is how well we are doing. Why? Because we are able to measure that. We are able to determine the progress that we are making. In, in, in our various areas. And then on teacher education, very important. I was trained as a teacher to get all the knowledge I can and impart it on the learners. 
I was not trained to allow the learners to learn, to create a condition where they will learn on their own. So the teacher possesses all the knowledge, and the, all the child has to do is show up and download what I am going to present. But that's not how the world works. And it's changing of mindsets. And now we're thinking of how is it possible that Connie can be in a school that neighbors me and does very well, but I'm the next door neighbor and I'm doing, not doing so well. And I cannot walk across and ask Connie, how come you're doing so well? What is it that you're giving your students that I'm not giving my students? So issues of creating communities of practice among the practicing teachers so that they can not only share resources, but they can share knowledge. They can share expertise. They can share pedagogical approaches that work. Because the main issue here is what works in your situation. And I'm normally impressed by my 11-year-old and 12-year-old boys. They get hold of my device, whether it's a phone or a tablet, they don't need a manual to go through that device. Mm -hmm. They will walk through the system and I'll find they've changed the settings and I'm complaining. <laughs> Who changed this? And said, Dad, don't worry. They just touch a few things and it's back to how it was. They are learning not by looking at the manual, but by interacting with that technology and experimenting, taking risks. So for me, that is how we need to excite the teacher that these learners are full of potential. You only need to give them an opportunity and they will learn. Okay. So talking about frameworks, can there be one common framework? I think we can agree on uh, a common framework in broad strokes, broad terms. However, the framework has to take into consideration our differences culturally and socially and it has to give us leeway to be able to express, uh, for example, in terms of communication. There are ways of communicating in my country that will not work in yours. And similarly, ways that you have that if you go to my country, you'll face a blank wall. And so, and so when we think about communication skills, et cetera, and all of these 21st century skills, we need to look at them within a context and so can we have one common framework? Probably, but again, in very general terms. The specifics, we would have to leave to individual countries on how to best um, flesh them out. Now, you, someone was asked a question about teacher education. And when we did the study for NECMAP, and teachers were saying that they needed mentors mentors who would show them what it really was to be using transversal competencies to be having them. And so that was a big question. Now, where do I find mentors for them? Mm -hmm. Like even in my own university, like who, and not just in the College of Education, in other colleges in higher education, like who among our professors are actually using all of these skills? and not just lecturing, which, is, which has been the most convenient way of, of sharing information, well, at least of doing your job. So I guess, and that's the challenge really. So how do you find now exemplars of the skills that we want our children to learn? And as what you've said, when you find that exemplar, you might, might as well take videos of that person and disseminate to everybody, because right now it is a challenge in my country where do I find mentors for them? Even within the College of Education, um, it's, it makes more this task quite lofty. Now, what can you do to help? Uh, many times, we do have a lot of research organizations, you know, giving proposals and doing a lot of research. When, when research is seen as a project, as an individual project, and when we don't look at it in terms of a, a broader goal, then you can really end up having piles of research in one's office. And so in my country, there has been a time when, yes, people have been engaging in research, but no one was really putting all of them together, so just so that we're able to make sense of all of them. And so if there are external organizations that would like to help, I think the help that can be done would be in that area, 
instead of establishing yourself as an organization doing good in a country, then take note of what has already been done and try to make use of what has been done and help the country synthesize and help the country make good use of the research that has been made available. Now for young children, um, well teachers say that it's easier to integrate the soft skills in preschool. Um, we have embedded soft skills within the curriculum. However, again, when you have teachers who, who feel that whatever's in the curriculum is more subject matter oriented, and they just see all of these as activities to get the job done, then that becomes quite problematic. And so uh, I think, again, Yes, we do have a curriculum for it where you do have soft skills, but our teachers would need to be able to see good examples of how those are actually practiced, even among young children. And so, again, I, I guess my, my last word would be, a lot of the things that we've been talking about are, are not just teacher education problems. They're actually problems of higher education too. So we're talking about basic ed, how do we produce all of these young learners with all of these skills. But what we're seeing now in basic ed would be a reflection too of what's going on in higher ed. And so our, I think reform is also due at that level, just so it trickles down also to basic education. Great, that's wonderful. Um, maybe one or two questions more. Wow. There. Thank you. I'm Hezbo Notieno from Kenya. Uh, in Kenya, when uh, you do driving, you get a driving license, and then you are told, as you go driving, consider yourself as the only sane driver on the road so that you can think out of the box. How do we help the teachers to think out of the box uh, rather than being uh, working under prescription? It's like the curriculum is so pre pre uh, prescriptive so that you stick to a certain form of work. Two, as we were going through the introductory remarks, uh, we saw how the, the partners in education are closer to the child. And uh, we have the parent and we have the government. In Kenya, and uh, might be this is one of the reasons why teaching is not the first choice. I, uh, I'm, I'm a teacher by profession, but my entry into teaching is much more uh, the South African way than the Kenyan way. Because to him, it was like, it was something that was developed in him through the, and a good example of a teacher. But to him, it's like it was a second choice, and then he perfected on it. So you find that in the Kenyan scenario, most of the people who enter are on second choice. And then I'm happy saying, then you work on the second choice to produce the best. How do we change that perspective to have an entry point whereby we say, somebody who graduates out of school says, among the major choices of career, then teaching becomes among the first of the choices. And I'm bringing in the parent and the government in two ways the Kenyan scenario again, whereby our, the success of a teacher is much more measured on the summative examination results, whereby you will be a successful teacher if you produce very many A grades as compared to somebody who has not produced the A grades and whereby ranking comes in. I saw also there was uh, some display of some ranking in a class somewhere here, and then it was written the first five, top five children. So that ranking of uh, schools, ranking of children, and then when our Minister for Education releases results, he says the top 
schools are this. The top candidates are this, based on summative examination. And so it means that those teachers who are teaching in schools which have not been ranked highly, then they are also considered failures. So now how do we remove that notion from the parent, from the government, so that we look at that there are other skills that can make a teacher look successful rather than the summative results in an examination. So that now the teaching, it, it can also change the, the pedagogical approach in terms of the teacher thinking out of the box. And it can also change the, the approach of the teacher training in a teacher college so that uh, the teacher can be developed to be an all-round teacher. So um, the two minutes that are left, I'm gonna just throw it out to whoever wants to respond to this question. It's an, it's an important question around, you can change curriculum all you want, but if the way in which you are evaluating the success of a teacher or a school system by a fixed measure that's you know highly high stakes and high, highly dependent on per a particular way of doing it, then how do you create um, the value creators that m many of you talked about? How do you create students who can be creative, create value for, for themselves and for society, and be able to function in a world where that kind of adaptability and flexibility of thinking is highly prized. So who would like to speak in 30 in, seconds or in, in our country, we, we did a large reform for teachers. And uh, the way we evaluate now teachers uh, doesn't have to do with the results of the students, basically, because we know that 50% of what happens comes from the socioeconomic environment of them. Uh, we try to balance how they plan their classes, how they uh, achieve, uh, they have rubrics of how their students are learning. Uh, obviously, we, we examine their disciplinary knowledge. You, know, you need to know some mathematics if you are going to be a math teacher. Uh, this is a process that is ongoing, but at least in the first two years, teachers have, well, with protest, accepted the process, and we are fine-tuning it, and we hope in the next three to four years we are going to, uh, with their collaboration and with their participation, uh, come with better instruments that really reflect their work, their everyday work, which is basically what we need to address. And just to respond to that, I think Hezbun is aware we scrapped the issue of ranking and the lawmakers actually went back to parliament to make a law to face us to go back into ranking. But more so <laughs> on the issue of what we can do for teachers, it, for me, it boils down to two things. It is trust and accountability. We have to trust that teacher whom we have, whom we've given our children to. We have to trust that teacher, we as parents, we as government, we have to trust that teacher that they are going to produce the results that we expect. But yet again, the teacher has to trust himself or herself that they are capable of handling that responsibility. And they must be accountable, not only to the children, not only to the government and community, but to themselves. Because I normally say this, you can never pay a teacher enough for what they do in terms of salary. You impact on generations. You impact and nurture and create so many people. You can never be paid enough. So the motivation is not in how much I get, but in the joy and beauty of seeing children go through your hands and acquire certain competencies. So for me, we are reforming all these things, but the trust we place on the teacher and the accountability that the teacher takes up in terms of the responsibility. This, you know, as a teacher, you are a co-creator. You're almost like God. You are a co-creator. <laughs> You're creating humanity in that classroom. Once they come to the realization that they are co-creators and they are working together with whoever else, then it will be a huge thinking change and a huge paradigm shift to thinking outside the box. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a lovely note to end on, this notion of teachers as being co-creators of children and communities and, and countries. And hopefully the next panel will continue that discussion. Thank you very much and enjoy the break for the next few minutes. <laughs>